The Holy Gospel for this day is recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Mark, the 11th chapter, selected verses. Here we find some of Jesus' teaching on prayer, and it serves as the basis for our sermon this morning. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt it in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we begin meditating on our gospel reading today from Mark chapter 11, let's ask for God's blessing in prayer. Lord, open now my heart to hear that through your word to me draw near. Let me your word ere pure retain. Let me your child and heir remain. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Gospels, it's kind of rare to hear Jesus speak woes or curses. And it's especially rare to hear him speak a woe or a curse to something instead of the someone. But in our Gospel today, that's what happened, right? Jesus cursed a fig tree. And he used this cursing of a fig tree as a springboard to teach us that faith-filled prayer is a powerful thing. So what you heard about in our gospel reading today actually takes place on the heels of the Palm Sunday story on the Monday and Tuesday of the first Holy Week. So as you know, on, on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, being acclaimed by throngs of people as the Messiah. And then he stayed in Jerusalem that day and he, he taught at the temple. But then at the end of the day, he, he left Jerusalem and went back outside of the city to spend the night in the village of, of Bethany, which is about two miles to the east of, of Jerusalem. And we're told that the next day, as they were leaving Bethany to go back into Jerusalem, uh, Jesus was hungry. And he happened to see off in the distance a fig tree that was in leaf. And so he went to that fig tree to find some figs on it so he could satisfy his hunger. Now, I'm not any sort of fig tree expert, and I'm guessing you're not either. But from what I've read, there's a, a certain type of, of fig tree in the Mediterranean area that actually develops uh, fruit buds while the tree's dormant during the wintertime. And then when the tree leafs out in the spring, that's the symbol, that's the sign that the, the figs are ripe. So it makes sense, wouldn't it, that Jesus would see in the springtime this fig tree in leaf, and he goes, oh, there's going to be some figs there that I can eat to satisfy my hunger. But as you heard, when he went to that fig tree in search of some fruit, all he found was leaves. And St. Mark does say that it wasn't the, the season for figs, but even so, he's just saying that the tree should have had figs on it because it had leaves on it. 
And that's when Jesus proceeded to pronounce a curse on this fig tree. He said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. Then the next day, on Tuesday of Holy Week, as they're going by that same spot on their way into Jerusalem, they noticed that this tree that Jesus had cursed had withered from the roots. And it seems like especially St. Peter was just astounded by this reality because he remembers what Jesus said and he's like, look, Rabbi, the tree you cursed has withered. And our Lord's response is kind of interesting because he doesn't explain why he cursed the fig tree, but rather he begins to explain how exactly it happened. And he uses this as a springboard to teach about the power of of faith-filled prayer. He says, Have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. The word of our Lord. It's kind of interesting because before Mark chapter 11, In Mark chapter 10, you have the account of of blind Bartimaeus. Do you recall that story at all? Bartimaeus was a blind man that lived in Jericho, and as Jesus is passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, uh, Bartimaeus finds out that, that the Lord Jesus is walking by, passing through. And so he begins to cry out loudly, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But the people around him are like, Bartimaeus, just be quiet. Stop making a scene. Just be quiet. But all that just causes them to shout all the louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And eventually Jesus stops and he acknowledges Bartimaeus and he asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, Rabbi, I want to see And Jesus says to him, go, your faith has healed you. It seems to me that Bartimaeus exemplifies what our Lord Jesus is teaching his disciples and us in these words from Mark chapter 11. All of Bartimaeus' cries and shouts and pleas were born out of a confident and lively faith that believed that not only could Jesus grant his request, but that he would grant his request on the level that he had already granted his request. It was just a matter of actually realizing the the effects of it. As Jesus looked into Bartimaeus' heart, it's evident from what Jesus says that he saw this this confident, lively, spirit-wrought faith. And all he could say was, Go, your faith has healed you. And when it comes to confidently asking things in prayer, of course, there's no better example than our Lord Jesus. And we see that in another instance today in our gospel reading. Because when it came to this unfruitful fig tree, he confidently asked, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And at that moment, his request was granted. The tree stopped receiving nourishment from the soil it was planted in. The sap stopped flowing between the trunk and the branches. And within a day, this tree had withered from the roots. And while the disciples were amazed at this, Jesus kind of says, this is no big thing, guys. A tree withered? That's nothing. Because he says, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, 
and does not doubt in their heart but believes that what they say will happen, it'll be done for them. Now remember this, Jesus is in Jerusalem's area, which means that the closest sea is 30 miles to the west or 20 miles to the southeast. So for a mountain to be thrown into the sea, a mountain from Jerusalem's area, that's kind of a big deal, right? And yet Christ says even that could be granted to someone confidently praying to their Father in heaven. So, he says, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. So in view of what what Jesus says here in our gospel, do you you find your mind right now kind of running wild with all the things you would confidently ask for that the Lord could then grant you because you confidently asked for it? Our minds can go lots of different sinful ways with a promise like this, right? Like, how can I confidently ask for $20 million? (laughs) How can I confidently ask for a Ferrari? How could I confidently ask just to lose 10 or 20 pounds? Our minds can go that way, right? And we can ask for these random blessings from God, believing that we can receive it if we, just, if we believe it strongly enough. And as you probably know, that's the direction lots of prosperity preachers will take a text like this. They'll say, it says right here, if you just believe hard enough, God will give it to you. Name it and claim it, and it's yours, right? I think we all have a sense that something's wrong with that sort of preaching and that sort of idea, but perhaps you have a hard time articulating exactly what's wrong with it because Jesus speaks so clearly, right? Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you received it and it's yours. But perhaps the first thing we can do is, is just let Jesus finish talking. You know, oftentimes, uh, sectarian preachers will pull a passage out of its context and let it stand kind of on its, on its own and, and then they'll shoehorn their own ideas into that passage and tell you that's, that's what it means. Instead of letting Jesus just finish talking and then let him shoehorn his theology into us, you know? But just think about it. Let's let, let Jesus finish talking. In this whole context of faith-filled prayer, Where does Jesus go next? In this topic of faith-filled prayer, he, he brings up the whole topic of forgiveness, right? Forgiveness. He says, when you stand praying, now I'm told that's the way a Jew would normally pray in private. When we pray in private, we tend to pray either kneeling or sitting down with our our hands folded and and heads bowed. But a traditional Jew would tend to pray standing, often with their hands outstretched like this, even looking up to heaven like so. So Jesus says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Haven't you found in life that one of the hardest things in life is to forgive someone who has wronged you? And I'm not talking about the the petty stuff. I'm talking about the serious stuff. The very damaging stuff. The hurtful stuff. The kind of stuff that that splits up marriages. The kind of stuff that that causes children to stop talking to their parents and parents to stop talking to their children. Uh, The kind of stuff that divides close friends. The stuff that drives a wedge between members of the same family or of the same team or of the same congregation. When that stuff happens, we all have a natural desire to hold on to whatever it was that that we've um, suffered and to hold it against the person who caused it and to hold on to it forever. 
you know what I'm talking about, right? Because on some level, you've experienced that in your life, in your relationships. And perhaps, you know, as, as you sit there in the, in the aftermath of that happening, and you, you sit there with your thoughts, perhaps you think to yourself at times, like, how could I possibly forgive this person for what they've done to me and how they've hurt me? Maybe it seems like forgiving them is about as hard as saying a word and watching a mountain pick itself up and throw itself into a sea 20, 30 miles away. Maybe it seems about as impossible as speaking to a tree and watching it wither in a day. It seems unlikely or impossible. But speaking of impossible, objectively speaking, Isn't it true that if anything is impossible, objectively speaking, it would be God forgiving us for our sins against him? Because each one of us has sinned against God more than any one person has sinned against us. And each one of us has committed sins that are more grievous than any one sin that's been committed against us. So if anything's impossible, it would be God forgiving us for our sins. But as you undoubtedly know, on a day that same week, Jesus prayed another very powerful prayer. It didn't happen on the Monday of Holy Week. It happened on the Friday of Holy Week, the Friday we call Good Friday. It happened shortly after Jesus himself had been nailed to the cross on which he died. In a sense, you could say that he was standing, and his arms were certainly outstretched, and maybe even his head was looking up to heaven when he said it. Do you recall what he prayed? prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And when he made that prayer, uh, that was a prayer, of course, for those that were immediately involved in his crucifixion. But it was also a prayer for us, because ultimately it was our sins that put him there. And when he prayed that prayer, he might as well have been asking for a mountain to throw itself into the sea 20 or 30 miles away. It was an impossible ask. But our Heavenly Father granted that petition. He granted that prayer. Because our Heavenly Father was actually working that very thing out through the very one who was on the cross praying the prayer. And because our Lord Jesus has died in our place, we have exactly what he prayed for. We have full and free forgiveness for all of our sins, all of our transgressions against God. And what a joy it is to know that and to feel the benefit of forgiveness. And now God calls on us to be little Christs, little gods in that sense where we get to hand out forgiveness to people. We get to forgive others as we've been forgiven. And that is one of our privileges in life as we live here in this world. So brothers and sisters, as you approach your Heavenly Father in prayer, ask for the divine ability to forgive others truly, to truly forgive them when they sin against you. And know that before you receive it, you can be confident that you can have it. As Christ says, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. And since you believe that you've received it, and know that you will receive it, you can live like you've received it. You can forgive your husband, 
You can forgive your wife. Forgive your ex-husband, your ex-wife. Forgive your child. Forgive your parent. Forgive your stepchild or your stepparent. Forgive your friend. Forgive your coworker. Forgive your classmate. Forgive your fellow church member. Whoever it is, forgive them. And if you need to, forgive yourself too. Because God has as well. Let's not be unfruitful trees in God's garden when it comes to this all-important matter. We see what Jesus reserves the right to do with unfruitful trees in his garden. We don't want any of that. But rather, may our Heavenly Father work strongly in us uh, that we might bear this beautiful fruit of the Christian life and forgive as we've been forgiven. But then lastly, real quick, as we approach our Heavenly Father for this all-important gift of forgiving others, which is something we need for life in this world, we can also boldly and confidently approach the Lord and his throne of grace for any other good and godly thing that we need to carry out our callings and our vocations in this life. If you need patience as a parent, or commitment as a spouse, or companionship as a single person, if you need faithfulness as an employee, or if you need uh, concern as a friend, or selfless love as a neighbor, whatever you need to carry out your callings, believe that you've received it as you ask God for it in prayer, and it'll be yours. Because faith-filled prayer is a powerful thing. Not because of the people like us who ask, but because of God who hears. Praise be to him, now and forever. Amen.